Paula Barahona with AIDS United. AIDS United works to end the AIDS epidemic in the United States. We do this through strategic grant making, capacity building, policy advocacy, technical assistance, and formative research. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Body Positive Syringe Services Program. The webinar will last approximately one hour. The presentation will take about 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes at the end of the session for questions. If you have any technical questions during the webinar, such as sound or computer problems, please contact us using the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. The Q&A panel is also where you can type in questions for our speakers about the content of their presentation, which they will try to answer during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar will provide an overview on how to build affirming and body positive syringe services programs from transgender and gender nonconforming people. For our discussion today, we have two distinguished presenters. First, I'd like to introduce Shira Hazan. Shira is the former director of the U Young Women's Empowerment Project. As a youth, Shira advocated for syringe services programs for her peer group. Since that time, she has focused on the experience of girls, boys, transgender, and queer youth involved in the sex trade and street economy. She has lived and worked in Chicago and New York City and has established four syringe services programs that serve the trans and gender nonconforming community. Second, I'd like to introduce Victory Motherwell. Vic is a program manager in trans health at the largest LGBTQA health center in the Midwest. He mobilizes the senior leadership team to create agency-wide trans competence initiatives as well as supervises the implementation of a HRSA-funded Trans-Pacific Research Grant. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We have a large number of attendees on today's webinar, so we're not able to take questions by phone. Please submit your questions via the Q&A box, and the presenters will answer them at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the AIDS United website. We will also send out a link to the re recording of the webinar to all attendees. With that, I turn it over to Shira and Vic. Well, hello, and um, thank you for joining us uh, today. I know that after last night, it took a lot for us all to be here on this call. And I want to thank us all for focusing on this life-saving information, because it's about to become even more necessary as our lives become even more at risk in the coming years. Um, Body positive syringe services is something that both Vic and I have worked on um, for years separately and together. And we're excited to talk to you about um, all of the different values that um, and practices that are a part of this work. Um, so let's jump in. Um, firstly, I want to just say that what this webinar is and what it isn't. Um, this is not everything you need to know. This is a, for me, has been a lifelong learning process, and I know that it will be for you as well. Um, but it's not even all you need to know to get started. It's just enough of what you need so that you can figure out what else you need um, to move you in the right direction. This also won't be a safer injection training, a syringe exchange 101, or a Hormones 101. Um, however, I do encourage um, you to go to all of those 101s, um, including Harm Reduction 101, um, if you haven't already done that. But what we will do today is have a short discussion of what it takes to build a program that comprehensively centers um, transgender and gender nonconforming people of color in syringe access programming. And we're going to be talking about um, people of color and non-people of color. However, um, in both of our work experiences, it's been um, the express priority of our um, personal missions as well as the missions of the organizations we work for to um, work with people who are most impacted, which necessarily means that we prioritize um, people of color. Uh, first and foremost in our work. So um, before we get too much further, um, if you could all just um, close your eyes, take a deep breath. Please don't do that if you're driving or commuting. Um, but if you're listening at your desk or you're somewhere where you um, can take a moment and safely 
um, close your eyes and imagine your most frequent needle exchange participant. Is that person young? Are they older? Are they white? Are they people of color? Are they transgender, cisgender, gender nonconforming? To build a successful program, you may need to widen the center of your work or deepen the center of your work to ensure that people are not just included, but actually the middle of the work. And so if the most frequent person that you imagined is not the person who you want to start expanding services for, then what we need to do is replace the image of that person with the person who you want to start seeing and then building a program around their needs. Um, it's often something that I say um, to people when they're talk thinking about program development is that what we want to do is build a program that captures the people who are most at the margins. And syringe exchanges, of course, we're often seeing people who are already at the margins. And so if they're at the margins of our exchanges, then they're really um, not being seen probably by many other providers. So if we can move the center to the margins, then we've widened the purpose of our work. A lot of what we're going to talk about today um, are um, little things that you can do and big things that you can do. One of the things that's impossible to capture is the culture of the exchange. And it looks like more than half of you from the little poll that we took um, are not currently running a syringe exchange. Um, and the other half of you are. Um, and so if you can imagine um, the first time you ever went into an exchange, um, that feeling and how different it was, and it was almost as though you went to another planet for a minute. Um, well, TGNC syringe exchanges also feel like another planet. And it's really difficult to communicate all of the little cultural nuances that make it so special and really magical and unique. Um, but we're going to do our absolute best to try to communicate some of what is necessary to try to build that culture. So the very first value of doing TGNC syringe exchange, other than harm reduction, um, I'm assuming that we all know that harm reduction is essential. Um, so if you can um, think about um, body positivity um, as part and parcel to harm reduction, um, that we can't actually effectively do syringe exchange without um, acknowledging whose bodies deserve to be present and whose bodies deserve to be saved. Um, we all deserve life-saving information. We all deserve opportunities and support. Um, but most importantly, we deserve to be in leadership. We deserve to play a role in decision making. And we deserve to be visible throughout the exchange. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what this looks like. Um, but body positivity is a really crucial component. The next crucial component is um, being gender affirming. So uh, gender affirming is um, a validating positive and holistic space where uh, transgender and gender nonconforming people can see themselves lovingly reflected. And so on a daily basis, this looks like making sure that bathrooms are accessible all the time, that gender neutral language is throughout your programming and on your forms, um, and that you're also um, rolling with gender fluidity, name changes, pronoun changes um, as a necessary part of every single interaction that you have, and that you're all willing to be in a constant state of learning around not only the individual participants um, who you see and their journey around gender and their decisions around gender, but also your own learning about your own gender and your own learning about what information um, people need in order to survive. So for example, um, even though I've been working in syringe exchange for almost 20 years now, and all of that has been with TGMC people, um, 
I, right now, I'm a little behind on hormone, um, and I need an update on hormones myself. And so in order for me to stay 100% relevant and important to the people around me, I made an appointment with a friend of mine who's a practitioner who's going to go over some of the new advances that have been made with me. And so that should become a regular value of your program. Um, the next um, a really critical value is body autonomy. And I think that we all appreciate body autonomy in syringe exchange. Um, I know that um, we all believe that people have the right to do what they want to do with their bodies and that we believe in this really firmly. I think the sticking point for people is often when people under, are under 18, um, but it is essential. Uh, that young people have access to needle exchange programs, hormones, um, and gender-affirming body-positive space whenever possible. It's more than necessary. It's life-saving. And then the next value is something that may seem um, surprising to some of you, but all syringe exchange services need to be trauma-informed. We deal with so much trauma in our daily lives. And I think we're about to see a spike in that um, in traumatic experience if last night is any indication of what's to come. And our sites, um, if our sites can't roll with what trauma looks like in programming, then we are not um, dealing with the reality of people's lives. And this is when you start to see pro people banned from programs because the program was not trauma-informed to begin with. So if you look around your city, and we all have one in our city, and you see a program where people are being banned or people are being denied services, and you know it's often couched in this person was um, broke a rule or was behavior beha like behaviorally challenging. Um, that is actually a really strong indication that the program itself was not designed to be trauma informed. Trauma informed programs have very uh, little of that happening. We also don't have security guards in our programs because we don't need them. We figure out other ways to be engaged with people in the space. But I also think on the other side of that, we offer as much holistic wraparound um, information and care and support as we can. So even if we're not um, based in the health center, we're an independent small exchange like mine was for so many years, we are wrapping as much around a person's whole life as we possibly can. Um, so those are the four or five basic values um, that really go into making a healthy long-term exchange that um, values and mirrors the community um, and, uh, and our sort of cultural norms. So next I want to switch into um, our history a little bit. I always want to take as much time as I can to honor um, trans and queer history. Um, not um, mentioned on this slide and not pictured is a woman named Arlene Hoffman, who was a part of all of this work, too. Arlene passed away before the digital age, and I scoured all of my community um, networks looking for pictures of her. And I haven't been able to come up with one yet, but it's very important that you know the name Arlene Hoffman and the critical role that she played in all of this. So the very first federally funded HIV prevention project serving transgender sex workers um, started in 1995 at an organization called Positive Health Project, which still exists. The person who wrote that grant, um, her name was Kelly McGowan, and she was partnered with the other person who you see there, Chloe Zabilo. And together, they um, started this syringe exchange program through Positive Health Project, and we know I am 100% sure that syringe exchange was happening before that with trans and gender nonconforming people. Um, and I would love to see a comprehensive history of all the little exchanges that were functioning um, out of the backs of cars and out of people's um, purses and pocketbooks, but this was the first brick and mortar funded syringe exchange that we see. Um, and it popped up in 1995. And so the details of this project were kind of great. Um, it was a trans only space, even though Positive Health Project 
was not a trans-only space. Um, the syringe exchange night operated, I think it was four hours twice a week, and they um, started it as a drop-in support group first, and then syringe exchange became the, a part of that meeting. There were five staff people, one person who worked the red carpet, and what that means is someone who welcomed people, but also made sure that people who were um, not trans or gender nonconforming did not enter the space during those hours. Um, two people facilitated the support group meeting, and it was a peer-to-peer -peer meeting. It was a trans-only space, including the facilitators. Um, one person who operated the exchange and two case managers. All five of these people, except the person who worked the red carpet, were trans-identified and gender nonconforming identified people. Um, at some point, it was really small. So it was really small for like the first year. They were seeing eight to ten people a night. And at some point, a gr the group requested a presentation by a doctor um, on um, surgery, gender confirming surgeries and hormone treatment. Um, and so they invited a doctor whose name is escaping me, but he was a, pre a preeminent surgeon. They um, invited him to come. And something like 75 people showed up to that event. And from that moment on, the exchange was just thriving and launched. Um, and then by 1997, um, they had um, that doctor begin prescribing hormones that um, twice a week in those um, meeting nights. So that's just a little story of the very first time so that you can start to imagine um, the history of this and the richness of how the programming was developed and built. Um, so how do we practice all of these values in our program? Well, first, everyone from the staff to the receptionist to the janitor to payroll must be changed to, um, trained in these values and practices. And the reason I say receptionist to janitor to payroll is because it really is that thorough. There's nothing worse than the receptionist disrespecting you or whoever the greeter is. If your exchange is very small, we never had a receptionist, but we certainly had the person who buzzed you in or the person who met you on the street. And if that person misgendered you, then the whole thing was over. Similarly with payroll, what a frustration um, when you have trans and gender nonconforming people on staff and you're making really unnecessary mistakes that um, truly distance and harm people. The next thing um, is knowing uh, Know Your Rights trainings. And I think we are familiar, hopefully most of us are familiar with Know Your Rights trainings. Um, but we want to make sure that people have access to how to manage the criminal legal system, police, and the healthcare system as well. Um, we also want to make sure that programs are staffed and led by trans and gender nonconforming um, people and people of color, color as much as possible. So if not throughout your whole organization, it should absolutely be in the whatever um, program you design for um, to do TGNC syringe exchange. I also strongly recommend beginning with only space, and only space takes time to build. Only space refers to um, creating a space that is TGNC only so that people know this time is for them and that it's for nobody else. And this should include whoever is providing the exchange, who's ever, anybody who comes into that space from start to finish should be TGNC identified. Um, the other thing is that all syringe exchange participants should have individual and group access to um, information about phobia and body positive philosophy. And so what this means is that people should really be able to uh, think through how they're responding. Um, and people need a critical opportunity to um, get this kind of information and training as uh, things come up that are um, not great, so as people misgender people or as mistakes happen, as transphobia unfolds, 
We want as many gentle conversations that are redirecting on the individual level, but also we want um, more fierce redirection if there's ongoing problems. We also want um, there to be agreement about how the space functions between all participants. Um, and we also want people to have access to sort of group conversation and training around systemic issues like transphobia, homophobia, um, and of course racism and classism that affect our community. We also want to be sure that we're using conflict as a resource. Feedback is so critical, and I think that so many harm reduction programs that I've been a part of actually think that we're doing a good job getting feedback because our programs are very horizontal in structure, and so we think we're hearing from people and we can tell. Um, but we need some sort of formal feedback mechanism because if not, we're missing a huge opportunity to use these conflicts as a resource for us to grow and for individuals to grow and to be able to hear from people when they're harmed by our programs or when our programs are missing the mark so that we can build deeper and further by correcting those mistakes either through one-on-one -on -one conversations or through program redirection. The other thing that I see a lot of harm reduction programs doing, and um, I see it in non-harm reduction programs too, um, is thinking that a gift card is a meaningful employment opportunity. So rather than hiring TGNC people on staff, we utilize people as outreach workers and then pay them in gift cards or stipends. And as you know, great as that can be at times, I really, really want to just say out loud once and for all that that is not meaningful employment and it's not meaningful leadership. Uh, we really want people to play a meaningful role in these programs. I also um, want to just say that so many of us have forms that do not work. Um, they do not work for our people. They do not work in our community. Um, my own programs have um, had to work with um, state forms, and those forms have been horrible, and there's nothing I can do about those forms. So I do create a shadow form um, that my people see, and then I do a second layer of work in order to translate the forms that go out into um, my community so that I can translate those forms back onto the state forms. But I don't force people to check boxes that don't make sense to them or answer questions that are harmful. Um, I have pushed back so often on the organizations that force us to use these forms. And what I hear time and time again is this is the way it has to be. And frankly, it doesn't have to be that way. So we need to continue the advocacy with uh, funders that we're working with and the organizations that we're working with about those forms. And then what we can do in the meantime is take that additional layer of work so that we can avoid traumatizing people, especially at the layer of forms. It's just not necessary. So the other thing that is really critical is thinking about um, my favorite bathroom in the world is a harm reduction bathroom. I love walking into bathrooms in harm reduction spaces. And every time I'm in a space that is um, like any kind of syringe exchange, my favorite thing to do is go to the bathroom and see what they've done. And I want you to think really critically about bathroom access for trans people. Are your bathrooms um, for all genders? Are they gendered? Are there three bathrooms for one kind of gender and no bathrooms for the other kind of gender. Um, how can that bathroom be as safe as possible? What supplies are needed? Um, I just want to really um, make sure that people think critically about bathrooms. The other thing is that um, all syringe exchange access for TNGC um, affirming and gender affirming services should be a part of other things. So if it's a part of a support group, if it's a part of a healthcare push, if it's a part of a weekly hangout night, that's great. Um, it needs its own, it needs to have a complete, we need to provide complete sort of community access experiences. 
Um, moving along, how is this kind of programming different than the programming you may be used to? So first is we can't measure success um, based on the volume of syringes out. When we're working um, with drug users, we are so used to being able to measure our success by the amount that we've distributed. And we can't do that because hormone use is not the same as drug use in terms of the volume of syringes. So we need to measure our success in different ways. We want to be looking at qualitative evaluation versus quantitative. We want to be thinking about participatory evaluation as much as we can. Um, and we also, another difference is that we want to be um, thinking about who's holding the power, particularly during the hours of trans-only services. And I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating, is that you really want to make sure that if a space is trans-only, that that means you have trans-only people on your staff and that you are doing your absolute best to have trans and gender nonconforming people throughout your entire organization in actual real leadership, meaningful positions, not um, as people who are faces of your program, but as people who have true power throughout your program. Um, the other thing that's different is that we don't have a huge amount of information about the intersection between hormones and other drugs of choice. And so that can be really challenging uh, for harm reductionists. We don't know an enormous amount about that. And that negative HIV and HI, um, HCV status is not in itself a measurement. Even though it's a critical component of the work, it is not in itself a measurement. And so what that means is that we may see lots of zero conversion in our programs, but we can't necessarily allow that to be a determination about whether or not our programs are successful. Um, and if I may, oh, sorry. Sure, if I may jump in with you on that particular point. Um, yes. Part of the, the like thing for people to have awareness around in terms of zero conversion and things like that is that within our trans and gender nonconforming communities, our rates for HIV are so much higher than almost any other subpopulation um, because of systemic oppression and multiple layers of that. So in you know specific communities, we're looking at rates as high as 49%. So just to kind of give people an awareness of, you know, our communities have a very different relationship to HIV and how it impacts people's lives. Um, both obviously in terms of their health, but also in terms of what sorts of resources they do or do not have access to um, in really different ways than it may in other communities. So just to sort of contextualize that with people. Thanks, Shira. No, it's, it's your slide. <laughs> this is you. Great, we're there. OK, so, um, <laughs> so thank you. Um, so to go <laughs> along with. Um, what Cheryl was just talking about previously as well in terms of how is this kind of um, programming different. Um, with um, some of the sort of systemic oppression stuff that we're talking about um, also relates to risks for incarceration. Um, so um, this has really important implications in terms of what Cheryl was mentioning, mentioning before about you know when we're building things that are trauma-informed, that means things like not having security guards changing your relationship with um, police um, and you know institutions related to police when it comes to overdose prevention and things like that. Um, because in terms of trans and gender nonconforming communities, rates of incarceration, um, rates of abuse and harm at the hands of police are so astronomically high um, that police presence and security force presence has a direct relationship on whether trans and gender nonconforming people will feel safe and in fact will be safe um, in any syringe exchange space and, and actually by extension any community space at all. Um, to go with that, you know, the levels of, um, you know, there's a, a point on here about death and murder and, you know, sure if you want to jump in with me on how exactly to frame that with people, but, um, you know, some of the stuff that our communities are dealing with are you know, murder rates that are um, 
so intense as to leave us feeling like we're sort of in a constant state of mourning. Um, and with that sort of paired hand in hand is also, you know, incredibly high um, attempted and completed suicide rates. Um, and so as we're moving forward into this presentation, I would ask that people are kind of thinking about that and what that means um, in context of things like body self-determination and um, the, the medicalization of trans bodies and, and what it means to um, to take one's own hands and one's own life, or life and one's own hands. Um, but anyhow, so that's there's a lot of deeper stuff there that we can certainly talk more about if needed. Um, so, and then in terms of overdose prevention and how is um, this programming different with TGNC folks, um, overdose prevention teaching within this context, especially if you have a larger focus on um, TGNC people, is not the same as it might be if uh, you're in a syringe exchange or I'm sorry, a syringe service program that um, is primarily focused on IDU. Um, so that's important stuff to kind of have an awareness of. Um, so uh, to get specifically into talking about what it looks like when um, a syringe service program is TGNC inclusive is sort of um, a paradigm shift around um, trans and gender nonconforming identified folks, but also um, what it means for uh, people to have a, a relationship to their own bodies that includes hormones. Um, because we're talking about syringes and needles, um, that relationship for many trans and gender nonconforming people will be their primary relationship to a, a syringe service program, um, even if they are also uh, injection drug users. So we find that um, people's adherence rates to their um, hormone prescriptions are many times higher than their adherence to any other medication that they may be prescribed, um, and that the ways people prioritize their hormone use um, is, is really um, directly related to sort of their relationship to feeling grounded in their lives. Um, so this note sort of starting here with the trouble around elective language, um, we sometimes will hear folks talking about, oh, well, you know, they want hormones or they want surgery or um, kind of talking about trans people in relationship to the medical services we need access to as an elective process or an elective thing that people need. Um, or want rather, instead of being able to contextualize it um, and say that, you know, there are um, there are all different kinds of trans and gender nonconforming people. Some people do need access to things like hormones and surgery. Some people don't. But for, for the folks that do, um, we know that access to hormones um, and, by extension, surgeries if that's what people need, but particularly hormones, is literally life saving um, for a number of different reasons. First and foremost, particularly when we're talking about trans women of color um, who are without question at the highest risk rates across the board when it comes to HIV, murder, um, systemic oppression around education, housing, employment, a whole host of different things. Um, the, the opportunity to have different ways to, you know, I'm, I'm putting this in quotes, but pass, right, um, is for a lot of folks, a, a question of life or death. Um, and so while there's a, a really huge conversation to be had about what passing means to different people, when it comes to people's safety, that's, that's the heart of the question, first and foremost for us as harm, reduction, harm reductionists, um, is really listening to and honoring um, what people know for themselves that they need for their own survival and for, for themselves to thrive. Um, as a health center, Howard Brown um, sees upwards of 2,500 uh, TGNC identified folks a year, um, and we have seen stark evidence that has shown us that um, the amount of harm that's reduced around mental health um, for TGNC people when we have access to trans affirming medical care, particularly hormones, is massive. So a reduction in anxiety, a reduction in depression, a reduction in PTSD symptoms. Um, as well as a host of other really positive um, outcomes for a whole lot of people. 
uh, with that um, is something that's important for people to kind of have in their heads is that because of systemic oppression, TGNC people's attempted suicide rates are around 40% um, nationally in this country um, as compared to 3 to 7% in the general population. Just to kind of give people a, some contrast of how, how big a difference that is. Um, so what I ask is that people really are able to put, wrap their heads around the fact that we can only serve um, our clients if they're alive, which is a really intense thing to say, but for, for us as trans and gender non-conforming people, that's really the size of it, is that we need our people alive. And whatever we can do to support and um, promote our people, not just um, wanting to be alive, but also having the opportunity and the access um, to be alive is uh, cru crucial to what we're trying to do. Um, so understanding hormone injection in use, um, there are um, a couple of things to know around the ways that people access the medical care that they need, um, depending on, on whether they have health insurance or they don't, whether they have an LGBTQ uh, welcoming or safe or health center in their area or not. Um, and so there are a lot of times people talk about street loans or street hormones or black market hormones or however people want to talk about it. Um, but, you know, TGNC people are resilient and make our way to get what we need in whatever ways we can. Um, one of those ways is gaining access to hormones, um, either through someone that they know or um, through someone that they um, find who is not a doctor and not prescribing um, above board. Um, ideally, in a, in a healthcare setting, we love to encourage people um, to get their own prescription whenever possible. Um, but the only way we can do that is if we go through and systemically uh, reduce as many barriers to people being able to be, do that as possible. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, something else to know in terms of um, actual injection stuff is um, the needle gauges are not the same as for steroids and for naloxone. Um, and I'll show a little um, chart in a, a few minutes to show some of the differences there. Um, but that's important to know not only in terms of what you stock in your needle exchange, but also um, being able to talk about what different kinds of safer injection techniques are, because they're actually quite different for um, uh, intravenous injections than they are for intramuscular or subcutaneous. Um, both of which are the two that are used when folks are injecting hormones. Um, hormone use is really intimate. Um, it also can be a sort of very sacred and um, emotional experience for people. Um, a lot of times for people who are just starting, it's, you know, it's a moment of literally like the day their life changed for a lot of people in usually really positive ways. Um, and for, for ongoing users, um, it is something that people have a really deep relationship with. Um, and so creating needle exchanges that, or I'm sorry, needle syringe service programs that um, honor the intimacy and the sort of depth of what um, trans and gender nonconforming people uh, affirming their own lives and, and having body self-determination means is a really big deal. Um, Self-injection versus friend injection or family injection. Um, within syringe service programs that are TGNC inclusive, we want to really affirm that, um, particularly um, within larger networks of TGNC people, there are you know large family structures, whether that's um, chosen family or within the ball scene, you know um, houses um, that are larger networks. Um, people have gay parents, gay mothers, gay fathers, all these different places that they might. Um, have someone being able to offer them um, injections of hormones um, in a different way that you might um, if we were looking at just st strictly injection drug use. Um, and so there's some important things in terms of outreach there as well um, when we're looking at how to get, um, how to really flood these networks with um, sterile needles and syringes. Um, it's really important to have, again, trans and gender non-conforming people on staff, because otherwise there's no way to reach all those networks um, or to even know where they are. So um, 
Also, hormone overdose prevention is quite different. Um, there are a number of elements to know, um, which having transgender non-conforming staff on, on hand will support. Um, but the first parts that are really important about it is that um, when people are taking hormones that are without a prescription, um, there's a lot of misinformation in communities around how to do that safely. Um, and so someone might recommend taking a much higher dose than is safe for someone to take in order to um, have the, the physical um, changes or transition that someone is needing, um, which actually can do liver damage, it can do kidney damage, it can um, do a number of different things to people's bones and mus muscles and, and all of that as well um, as having really intense uh, emotional and mental health impacts on people. Uh, the other part of that is that you know every human being has a mixture of different kinds of hormones that their body makes. Um, and so when you put a system with too many um, hormones of one kind, the body actually starts to convert it into another kind, which is interesting. So for instance, if I take too much testosterone, my body actually starts converting some of it back into estrogen, um, which actually stands in people's way of being able to transition in the ways that they need to. Um, so all of that knowledge is um, sort of in-house knowledge that's really important to have. Um, and you know, the, the more you're able to rely on the expertise that trans and gender non-conforming people bring, the more you're able to, to really um, robustly offer some of that information so that the community is getting um, what they need as safely as possible. Um, so this little guide um, I put together just for people to have a look at and, and be able to um, use within your own uh, syringe service program, if you so desire, um, but just to give people an idea of um, the variety of different kinds of needles that people might like to use when it comes to hormone use specifically. And um, I wanted to kind of go through the use stuff as well, um, at least in, in the written down form for people to have so that there's a, a chance to see that there's a, a different um, approach when it comes to hormones in terms of switching out needles, but also what you use for the draw is different than what you use for the injection, and also depends on whether someone is um, doing intramuscular shots or subcutaneous shots. Uh, and all of that can be accomplished with some good, thorough, uh, safer injection trainings on each of those types. So, uh, Cher, I believe that's you. Is that true? Yes. So I just want to talk, uh, I want to fly through some of this. Um, I'm not seeing a bunch of questions and answers, uh, or questions coming from the audience. So if you guys don't have questions, we will just keep talking. Um, as we see questions, um, we are going to stop in about probably seven or eight minutes. Um, and so if you want to get your questions out there, otherwise we will um, keep uh, talking. Um, so. Um, I just want to fly through some of these, even though they're super critical, uh, but um, I'm going to fly through the assessment and the evaluation because um, most of what is on the slide um, is what you need to know. Um, but I do want to talk for a minute about pumping parties. Um, pumping parties are um, um, something that people do when they get together and um, use uh, silicone together. Um, medical providers, um, and I've even heard many harm reductionists be incredibly shaming about silicone. It can have a lot of harsh effects on um, the body and people's health. And so if you could um, rethink how to positively frame silicone, why is it so important for people's survival, why do people want it, um, how can this be incorporated into um, your existing work so that we can get really creative about harm reduction. Um, one of the best things um, that I ever did around silicone was have pre-parties. Uh, and so people would come to pre-party um, at my site, um, and we would talk about all the different options and ways of staying safe and create all these lists. And also, I would give out party kits and um, then um, people also knew where to come if things didn't go well. Um, the other thing that's really critical is that um, silicone does have an impact on how we teach overdose uh, for IDU. So if people are um, IDU users, um, you can't um, 
inject into silicone. You can't inject naloxone into silicone. So we teach people to go into um, the butt or the thigh or um, through their clothes into the arm. But it's important to know that if uh, someone has silicone, um, that naloxone is not, it's, I don't know what will happen, but I, it won't get through the silicone into the bloodstream as quickly. Um, and I don't know where it will hang out, um, as it were, um, in the body. So I think that's really critical that we teach, um, uh, shift how we teach IDU and naloxone use. Um, the next um, slide is that uh, getting into how we know we are on the right track. And so one of the main ways that you'll know is that you're actually building real community, that people are not only coming for syringes. And this is so critical, um, and many of you who run exchanges now can probably see this already in your programs. Is one of the ways we know harm reduction is successful is that people come for more than just the service. Um, you also want to make sure you're doing as much participatory evaluation as you can. Participatory evaluation is a special kind of evaluation, and you can Google or reach out to me for more information about how participatory evaluation works. But it's a really critical component to making all harm reduction and syringe exchange services successful, but particularly with TGNC people, because we want that qualitative data um, over quantitative data. So we also, again, um, want to make sure that people are playing lead roles, um, which is really, uh, again, common in harm reduction programs, but what even common is who's in those roles. And so we want to make sure TDNC and POC people have truly meaningful positions in syringe services. Um, we also are looking to see more people linked and enrolled in care, um, more people connected to treatment, and more people connected to quality general health services, including housing and primary care. Um, we also want more people um, showing up to your exchange for resources that are not connected to your, to your exchange. Um, and I mentioned this before, but it bears repeating that we want to see new community building and that those communities are thriving um, off of the strength of, e of being together, not only off of um, giving and receiving tips and tricks and tools, um, but that the, there's something that is birthing and forming that's um, intangible. Um, because it's so um, special and it's about the magic between people in community. Um, and of course, one of the other things that harm reductionists are best at is building long-term relationships. And that's another measure of success that you'll see in your program. And the one that I am particularly um, uh, um, passionate about is that we interrupt isolation. So many um, trans and gender nonconforming people die as a direct result of being isolated, either because they um, are so alone in, in their own world, uh, because they don't pick up the phone, because they're afraid of calling 911 in a time of emergency, or because um, they don't know other people, but there are so, other trans people, but there are so many studies that talk about um, the is isolation in TGNC communities, and its effect on um, longevity of life. And so as much as we can interrupt that isolation, um, that's what we're looking for. So um, I also want to talk to you about uh, one result that we saw at Young Women's Empowerment Project through our evaluation is that um, we did a survey, or we did a participatory evaluation study to try to figure out what made our exchange and our harm reduction services work. Because as you have probably all experienced, measuring harm reduction is like trying to get a tape measure around the world. It's just so uh, difficult to do it inch by inch. And so we uh, did this beautiful project where we found that um, the way we could tell our project was uh, successful is that young people in our program were able to apply harm reduction throughout their lives. So they could apply it to the dollar menu at McDonald's, crossing the street, the route home. That harm reduction became a philosophy that was in, um, applied to their whole world and not just something that 
they thought of as a risk reduction. And that was the true measure of our success. And we found that young people who were involved in our programs year, uh, for a year or more could apply harm reduction to a variety of um, um, issues in their world and that they were using harm reduction philosophy as a new way of moving through life. And that was the truest measure of our success that we had. Um, and so uh, that was a result of a participatory evaluation study, and I think that you can prove that too in your programs as well. So these do's and don'ts are really straightforward, and so I'm going to skip them in the interest of time so that we can hear the story of SHINE, um, which is the program that Vic um, runs that's about to launch next week, no, in two weeks. Um, and I want to turn it back over to Vic. So, <laughs> yay. Um, so I'm the, I'm the weirdo in the I Love Paris sweatshirt, if you're wondering who I am. Um, so this is some of our, our team members being pictured here um, who are amazing. And the, the prior picture on the slide before was actually um, this uh, program that we are working under is called Special Projects of National Significance, and it's a, a HRSA grant. And so the folks on this prior slide are some of our former colleagues um, from this team who also contributed a ton to making this possible. So I just want to highlight both of those beautiful groups of people. Um, so SHINE um, is an acronym that one of our brilliant team members came up with, which is Safe Harbor Incorporating Needle Exchange. Um, I know the language around needle exchange or um, syringe services is shifting, but that's what it is for us at the moment. Um, so I'm going to try to move quickly as well. Um, there's a lot here, but I, I don't want to belabor it. Um, so we, I, you know, Shira and I uh, have sort of been in community with each other for, for a long time. Conversations around the need for needle exchange or syringe services um, at Howard Brown have really been a conversation at least 10 years in the making. Um, but specifically, leadership uh, within Howard Brown shifted in the last number of years to make it possible that we could actually start building towards it in reality. So for the last year and a half, two years, we've been working very closely together to build out SHINE as a program. Um, one of the things that um, Shira asked me to mention is that we've had a ton of um, organizational staff changes that have really led in part to this um, possibility. So uh, going from, you know, when I started here 10 years ago, there was one trans-identified woman in a management position in the entire organization, and she was the only one, to my knowledge, um, in the organization's 40-year history. Um, right now, uh, we now have over 20 trans and gender, gender nonconforming identified staff members throughout the organization, throughout different positions, um, including a number of leadership positions. And that has made all the difference. So I really want to um, contextualize that as well in terms of the success of your programs. Um, that is, these are parts of um, long-range goals, but they're really profound long-range goals. So just to give people a snapshot, what that's meant in terms of um, our organizational cultural shift and also our, our client base is that even as recently as 2009, between 2009 and now, we've seen a 495% increase in our client base of folks who are trans and gender nonconforming identified. So that's enormous. And there, there are very few programs um, within Howard Brown and potentially elsewhere who could say that they had gone through that enormous of an increase in patients um, in that short of a time. So, and there's, there's multiple elements that have gone into that, but it's something we're extremely proud of and continue to work towards. Um, the other part is that we wanted to build a replicable model um, in SHINE that could be used elsewhere across our organization. So uh, our, we're, we're lucky in that our um, chief operating officer and our CEO um, and our chief medical officer are really invested in this idea in a way that's beyond what we expected. Um, so we are building out the concept um, to work specifically within our trans and gender nonconforming programs, um, but they are invested and excited about the idea of that being something that functions as well in other programs across the organization and perhaps, perhaps elsewhere. Um, so to contextualize kind of briefly, part of why um, SHINE makes sense in this environment but is also different than a syringe service program somewhere else is that um, Howard Brown is a federally qualified health center. 
So quite different than you know a certain service program operated out, out of the trunk of someone's car or out of an organization that may be much more under the radar. Um, it means that we've had to look at things like liability um, and all of the like le legal ramifications of this in a really different way than we might. It also means that we have different resources on hand. So in addition to having really holistic um, healthcare offerings here, including behavioral health, um, primary care medical services, case management, uh, elder health, a whole bunch of different elements that we have right in-house, we also have medical providers right on hand that can assist in situations like an overdose situation or um, a number of different uh, like healthcare issues that may come up within the context of needle exchange or syringe exchange, syringe services. Um, so that element of um, wraparound services, specifically including wraparound HIV care services and case management, plays a huge role in uh, supporting our trans and gender nonconforming healthcare here. Um, but it's that element of also building out a really robust trans healthcare offering here um, that has also shifted and made it possible for us to do that. So uh, that looks like a number of different things for us, including um, three different sort of support groups, one for trans youth, one for, I should say, trans and gender, gender nonconforming youth, one for trans and gender nonconforming adults, and then one for everybody. Um, and so it's actually within that context, which is our program called After Hours, um, that we're operating SHINE. So After Hours um, bears some relationship to the Positive Health Project that Shira was talking about earlier uh, from the early 90s in that um, after Hours is a program in which we literally shut down our entire clinic except for, for our trans and gender nonconforming clients. Uh, and so it's in the evening, right? So it's all these, all these different harm reduction and, and trauma-informed decisions were made to make it a space that really works for TGNC folks. Um, it's during the evening at 6 to 9 p.m. on a Friday night. Um, it is just for our folks and staffed also primarily by trans and gender nonconforming staff. And um, the idea is really to create a setting in which there's no wrong door or no wrong point of entry for people to both become clients or patients here at Howard Brown or to continue engaging in care. So uh, within this context, we um, welcome people to bring a loved one or a family member to come with them to see the provider, and they can be in our main waiting room together, whether they're trans-identified or not, in terms of that, that uh, loved one. But we also have an entire area of the clinic which is really just for trans and gender nonconforming folks, both staff-wise and client-wise. What that means is that RMAs are not going back into that space unless they're TGNC identified to grab whoever's next for being a me medical provider. Um, our medical providers are not going back there unless they're identified as well. Everybody on staff understands that space, and it's within that space that SHINE is going to be operating. Um, so it will be entirely by and for us. Um, within that, we also are creating very specific dynamic programming that is dreamt up and built out by trans and gender conforming staff members. So everything from incredible panel discussions on um, trans women of color surviving the prison industrial complex to um, fat phobia and how it impacts trans and gender nonconforming people um, in the world of body positivity and dating and relationships and um, the gambit. So it's, it's all kinds of different things like that, as well as um, asking guest speakers to come and talk about things like immigration status and um, expungement records, expungement of records around um, all kinds of different legal issues that trans and gender nonconforming people are struggling with. And um, there's so much more we could talk about about what SHINE is and how it will work, but really the heart and soul of it is creating things that are by us and for us as transgender gender nonconforming people. Shira's done a beautiful job at um, focusing on that, but I really that's really the, the <laughs> central theme of how you can do this well. Um, there is no way to create trans and gender nonconforming safe spaces without staff members who are of and understand on a personal level um, how our communities function and how our, our people um, bring their needs to the table. 
So that's that's the heart of it for me. So I also just want to talk for um, one minute about this beautiful syringe exchange program that I was most recently a part of. That was run entirely by um, cis and trans girls in the sex trade and street economy between the ages of 12 and 24. And actually, um, the exchange itself was run by um, trans and gender non-conforming people of all gender identities and expressions. And uh, YWIP as a whole um, was um, for both cis and trans people across the board. It was a very girl and femme identified project. However, there were also a few masculine identified people in the project. Um, and it was a really like loving, rich, magical program. Um, at some point, we started operating. We actually had operated our own syringe exchange for about nine years. Um, and it was always a program that people could just go into the bathroom and take whatever they needed, um, sign out on the form, boom. And at some point, we um, started a partnership with a um, homeless uh, youth program here called the Broadway Youth Center, which works with homeless LGBTQ young people. Um, and the program was called SEXY, which stood for Syringe Exchange Expansion for Youth. And that was for um, trans and gender nonconforming people only. But we only, of course, always had IDU um, syringes available, of course. Um, but uh, that program operated once a week at, the, at their site. So people could come um, anytime to get syringes from us and duck into our bathroom, do whatever they needed to do. Um, and then we were once a week at this other site. And that, as far as we knew, for 10 years was the only syringe exchange that was operated by um, young people, um, not people under 30, but people who, uh, the, the two people who held it down were 17 and 19. Um, and they aged with the program, so um, they stayed for a really long time. But one of the principal cores that I want um, feeling, sentiment that was in the exchange in YWEP that I want to leave you with um, that was a huge part of our work was um, this phrase by um, Leela Watson, who is an Aboriginal activist, who said, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And I think after last night's election and where we're at in this presentation, I just want to end on those quote on that quote. I also um, noticed that there's a few questions here about um, funding space uh, or funding and funders. And um, folks from the AIDS Institute um, are are going to follow up with people about funding questions. Um, it looks like someone else has also posted a comment about funding, but I just didn't want to hang up without acknowledging that we saw those questions and that someone else is going to follow up with you all. So thank you so much for being present with us today um, and focusing on our community and for the interest and commitment that you have to making sure that trans and gender nonconforming people stay alive and get what they need. On behalf of AIDS United, I'd like to thank Shira and Vic for sharing this insight and information. And thanks to everyone for joining this webinar today. Have a great afternoon.